So the next speaker is an old friend of the Huff Heinz Institute. She was actually actually came from uh, Georgia last year just to come to the discussion, to, to see it and hear it. And so we're really proud to have her as a speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mindy Millard Stafford to the stage. Thanks, Dr. Lightfoot and all of the Huff Heinz staff for the kind invitation and warm hospitality. The question I've posed, when, Will women outperform men in sport? This is one that's been raised by many over several decades, and it's really tough to answer based on scientific data. The reason, because not only biology or nurture, but also the environment, uh, nature versus nurture comes into play. There have been examples over the years when women have outperformed men. In 1973, the battle of the sexes 55-year-old Bobby Riggs defeated by 29-year-old Billie Jean King. Or last summer, when two women outperformed their male counterparts in passing the US Army Elite Special Operations Training Course. So this, this is not new that on occasion women might outperform sport. But these examples don't really answer the question because we don't know what part of the sample distribution we're testing from. Elite athletes, by their nature, are outliers at the top percent of the curve. Let's take, for example, if we have a typical male enter a 15-kilometer road race, he might put up an average time. But it's highly likely there will be a highly trained woman who will beat him. But this isn't really answering the question, will women outperform men in sport? Because we have to ensure, instead, that we're sampling from the same part of the population distribution. The best versus the very best is one strategy. When it comes to nature versus nurture, we know that possibly there could be a point in time where the performance gap between men and women are solely due to biology. Are we there yet? In terms of nurture, women have been playing catch up for quite a while. In the first modern Olympic Games 19, before 1900, no women were invited. But in 1900 in Paris, 22 women participated, about 22% of all the population of athletes. They competed next to men in sailing, equestrian, and croquet, but were segregated by sex in golf and tennis. Thereafter, the next several Olympic Games, more sports were added, included swimming, archery, and track and field. But in 1928, during the 800 meters, reportedly, some women collapsed. And Olympic officials immediately deemed this distance was too great a call on feminine strength, with the concern that exhaustion would harm the reproductive organs. This event would not return for another 32 years. There was a small uptick in performances by women in the Olympics, but really the action started after 1972. In the United States, with the passage of Title IX, all federally sponsored educational programs, including sport, had to be equal funding for boys and girls. And this has been credited with a very large rise in female participation. It would not be until 40 years later, the 2012 Games in London, that every country had at least one female athlete as part of their delegation. But the areas of coaching and upper echelons of administration have not exactly kept up. Prior to 2004, no female coach had ever been a part of the US Olympic swimming coaching delegation. Even today, the IOC has a stated goal of increasing female participation in leadership positions, particularly international committees, federations. But look at this picture from just last month, taken by the IOC meeting. We still have a way to go in terms of women getting into those types of positions. So it's clear there's this balance between nature and nurture. And fortunately, with the history, nurture has started to be leveled the playing field for women. Girls can now 
enjoy the same quality training and coaching programs as boys, and grow up in a culture where sport is viewed as acceptable behavior. This is in, of course, many countries, but not all around the world. And then the reward structure has improved to elicit motivation to, for girls to pursue sport at the very highest level. Prior to 1984, there was no marathon for women. And thus, this along with dis other distance running races, there were fewer incentives prior to the 1980s. This factor of nurture was therefore not really considered in a very famous paper that got a lot of attention, published in the journal Nature in 1992. And it indicated and asked the question, will women soon outrun men? So doctors Whip and Ward plotted the historical progression of mean running velocity over a variety of distance races from the marathon down to the 200 meters. And as you'll notice that in the women's time frame, this is more compressed and the slopes are a bit steeper. And so their statistical modeling indicated that by 1998, women and men would both be under two hours and two minutes in the marathon and it would take a little bit longer for the other distance races for the gap to eventually close. Those familiar with distance running understood that this rapid rate of improvement in women was not due to necessarily a biological advantage, but more to the positive societal gains. Even elite athletes themselves at the time, the late and very great Greta Weitz, says, as long as women are women, I don't think they will surpass men. Subsequent analysis of world record performances that started instead from the 1980s onward have found that the performance gap between men and women in distance running has held pretty steady between 10 and 11%. If we look at today, the world record in the marathon. Last year, D Dennis Cometo, his time is about 10% faster than that set by Paula Radcliffe. What about in sprint events on the track? Usain Bolt's time, about 10% faster than the 1988 time set by Flojo. And if we move to the field events, in the high jump, men about 15% have jumped higher than women, the very best, and in the long jump, similarly, about 16%. Throwing the javelin, well over 20% men can throw farther. Pound for pound, what if we look at similar body mass between men and women? In the same weight class for men and women, in the combined snatch, clean and jerk, again, men are 20% stronger. So as we move to, from distance to explosive power and strength, as well as when there's an upper body component involved, the gap tends to widen a bit more. So what explains the reason? Why are men faster and stronger? The plausible explanation is biology, nature, inherent genetics, and the differences based on sex. Physical characteristics that are conferred on men as they go through growth and maturation due to testosterone are well characterized. Michael Phelps at six foot four is taller than most women. But in addition, he has a relatively long forearm hands the size of dinner platters, a wingspan of 84 inches, narrow hips, flat backside, and large flippers for feet. So if we looked at a group of boys and girls as they grow through growth and maturity, we would expect the effects of testosterone to gradually show their effect. And we recently took the top rank 16 times for boys and girls in USA Swimming and we match them by rank. And any plot or dot above the red line indicates that the boys were faster. Even at nine and 10, in more cases than not, boys are faster than girls, but not by much. At 11 and 12, only in the distance freestyle swims are girls sometimes faster. And at each progressive age group, the performance gap continues to widen until senior nationals we're in the sprint, 50 meter free, men are 13% faster compared to about 7% for the distance swims. 
So again, what is it that biologically separates the guys from the girls? There have been several studies that have compared elite cohorts of distance runners over the years, and it seems quite clearly that men have a greater overall maximum oxygen carrying capacity, or VO2 max, due to a lot of related factors, probably greater lung volume for ventilation. Even when scaled for stature, airway diameters, and diffusion surfaces may be greater in men, a greater left ventricular mass and greater blood volume, therefore improving blood flow or cardiac output. Men have higher hemoglobin concentration, and hemoglobin binds oxygen, thus oxygen carrying capacity tends to overall be higher in men than women. And of course, with a greater muscle mass, this allows greater force production. In contrast, due to the effect of estrogen, women have greater sex-specific fat. And this, even in the most highly trained woman, can be as much as 8% greater than their equally trained male counterpart. This fat acts as a load that has to be carried in weight-bearing activity. However, ironically, Recently, scientists have again postulated that maybe women can put this fat to good use, that surely in distance swimming, fat can act as a buoyant force and improve swimming economy. Unfortunately, so far, that theory does not exactly hold water because with the advent of Olympic open water and FINA World Championships in events as long as the 25 kilometers, men are still 7% faster in open water swimming. Another way to answer the question, when will women outperform men, is historically. As remarkable as the seven Olympic gold medals were of Mark Spitz in 1972, those records of that era have been surpassed by the women of today. So to answer the question, when, in the sport of swimming, it's taken 38 years to outperform men. I'd be remiss if I didn't also discuss a few examples where women have the chance to be equal or maybe exceed male performances. In the Olympic Games, the equestrian is competed together, men and women. And in 2012, Anki van Grunsven won the dressage gold medal. But it takes a special filly to beat the fellows. In 140 years of the Kentucky Derby, only three fillies have ever won. But this may be due more to the greater financial rewards for stud fees from a male stallion. Just ask American Pharaoh. And then also, other events. Historically, shooting has sometimes been combined. The professional bowling leagues, boys and girls, men and women, are together. And driving a race car, or piloting a bobsled, individual women have competed successfully against men. So in events that de-emphasize explosive power, strength, or endurance, these have the greatest potential for parity over time. So will women outperform men in sport? It seems like sex is a major factor influencing world records in objectively measured sports, those measured by seconds, kilograms, or centimeters. And due to the improved sociological and environmental opportunities for women, the performance gap in these sports has actually stabilized for the past several decades. But based on biology at this point in time, women do not appear to be likely to run or swim as fast or jump or throw as far as men in Olympic events, where the human body is the motor. Let's not forget, too, sports can be a public health solution to today's obesity and physical activity in ap epidemic. And we know that boys stay active longer than girls. Girls drop out. So not only are they missing out in the health benefits of exercise, but perhaps characteristics such as goal setting, positive body image, leadership skills, discipline, and resilience in the face of adversity 
that we learn on the sport environment. So let us continue to think in view of the public health of our youth today to not only get girls, but keep girls in the game. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. So I've got a couple questions for you. Uh, Mick from here at, at Texas A&M said, is the difference not related to the amount of muscle? Because women have less muscle per kilogram body weight. It clearly is one of the factors. Uh, as I tried to mess, I did put a little image of muscle up there, but that's clearly it. Um, you know, and then the whole issue of trainability in terms of it looks, particularly in lower body, there seems to be less of a discrepancy than upper body uh, strength. So we have uh, Mike B. from UT Austin says, do you think men rely more on maximizing individual nature or the physiological components and women rely more on maximizing nurture or the psychological components? Um, I'm getting a bunch of messages here. Sorry. Um, and do you think it's easier to train to improve one or the other, the nature versus nurture? Wow. I think I'll leave that question for Claude next. Uh, you know, I think if we think about, um, you know, I was really blessed to come through a time when all these opportunities exploded for girls. No, no academic scholarships, or there was only academic scholarships, not athletic ones. The coaching ranks for women was very much, it was a tough road. So uh, is, is that completely cured? I think I mentioned, particularly in the coaching ranks, may, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But uh, so how much does that impact the actual sport performance? I don't think we know. And I think the, the whole thing is how do we measure the sociological impact? Mm. It's really difficult to put a number right. to, to that. To quantify that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So one last question here. Alex R. from Texas A&M. Uh, Katie Ledecky surpassed Ryan Lochte in the mile and tied Michael Phelps, uh, Phelps excuse me, in the 400 meter. Should she be allowed to swim the 1500 meter in Rio? Well, she don't, you don't have to worry about that. The Olympic Games does not allow women to swim the 1,500 meters. The highest distance event, and is it because old ideas? I don't know. She can only swim the 800. The men compete in the 1,500. And there are other examples where these events are still not the same. So for a distance swimmer, that's a real uh, disadvantage. Yeah. And she hasn't surpassed them yet. <laughs> Getting close, though. So please join me in thanking Dr. Millard Stafford for her time here. Thank you. Thank you.